live stream right now. There we go. So Luke 21. And this morning, this is just where we are in our text. And we're going to see that uh, we are going to be moving through the rest of Luke in the mornings. We're taking a different kind of course than normal, a little shifting of gears, uh, where normally we're doing a smaller chunk in the morning, really diving deep and, and, and running off the rabbit trails. And at night, we're moving through the Bible at a faster pace. We're doing an end time study at night. And so in the mornings, we are going to finish the book, book of Luke off verse by verse in the mornings. That way, this morning crowd, we miss not a single verse because chapter 22 is the arrest. It's the Last Supper, the arrest of Jesus, Garden Gethsemane, going into Pontius Pilate, the crucifixion, the resurrection. So all of that we'll be covering in the mornings unless God, as always, changes my plans. He has a tendency of doing that from time to time. Today, we're going to start in verse 5, and we're going to go all the way through the end of the chapter. It's a bigger chunk for us. And yeah, I'm just going to dive right in because we've got a lot to cover today. Verse 5, Luke 21, then as, some of them, uh, then as some spoke of the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and decorations, he said, these things which you see, the days uh, will come in which not one stone will be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. We'll pause there, we'll pray one more time, and then we'll get moving. Lord, I pray that just as you were speaking to these people on this day, about what was in their soon-to-come future, that we would hear what you might speak to us about what is laid in store for us, and that we would listen and have ears to hear. And God, if you're there speaking, we really want to hear from you today what you would have to speak. And so give us open ears. Give us soft hearts. Don't let us stand in the way of what you would want to speak to us today through your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so um, right off the bat, there is, um, there is three accounts that are very similar, but I believe, and I, I'm pretty persuaded, and I, I would even say I'm in the minority. I, I'm, this is not the most popular opinion, that Luke's account of this day is different than a very similar preaching in Matthew 23 and Mark 13. Those are what's called the Olivet Discourse. They call it the Olivet Discourse because both of them say that Jesus makes these comments about how one stone will not stand upon another. And Matthew and Mark say, and then he goes over to the Mount of Olives. Mark tells us specifically it is only Peter, James, and John. I can't remember if Andrew is there. I don't think Andrew is there for this one. Inner circle, the inner three, and they're having a small group discussion, and they talk a lot about the end times. In Luke's gospel, though much of it is similar, it seems as if in verse 7, so they ask, saying, teacher, when will be the signs of this be? And what are the signs uh, will be? And what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? It seems that this is a direct question immediately while they're standing by the temple. Here's the temple. They're looking at it, and people want to know, what do you mean one stone not going to stand upon another? Jesus gives this teaching, and then later they retire to the Mount of Olives, which is where our chapter ends today, it says, and then he spent the day teaching, then they go out to the Mount of Olives, and then Peter, James, and John are like, when's the end of the world again? Because he's talking about the temple being destroyed. And to them, to these good God-fearing Jews... That's the end of the world. It is unthinkable that the temple would be destroyed. Years upon years, King Herod started, Herod the Great. Herod's long dead, and this temple wasn't quite finished. The temple was still being expanded upon and worked on in Jesus' day. Big temple. What happened? We'll, we'll see more later, but I'll give you the short story about why one stone not upon another. We're going to look at Jewish history a little bit. So what happened is during the siege of Jerusalem, 70 AD, there were some Roman soldiers who threw a burning torch into the temple. The temple got set ablaze. The temple's on fire. If you've seen pictures of the temple, I really should have had one to put up there. The whole roof of the temple was solid, well, not solid, but overlaid in solid gold, right? Everything is covered in gold. When this place burned, all the gold melted from the heat down into the temple walls. And by the time the temple was destroyed, which Titus, 
the general in charge, future Caesar, he said he wasn't trying to destroy the temple. But once this happened, he told the soldiers, and these soldiers, I just watched a, an hour-long video about the siege of Jerusalem and just the, the way it played out. These guys have been sieged for a long time. The Romans had lost many battles trying to fight the Jews. They were angry. They were sore. They were tired. And so when this temple burns down, they were going to loot it. You can go to Rome today and see Titus's arch, which shows pictures of them carrying the menorah out of the temple they looted what things down below, but the gold from the roof had fallen into the cracks. And so the Roman soldiers began dozens of men on one stone to take every stone and knock it over so what little gold they could scrape out from the cracks could be retrieved. And one stone is tossed to the next stone to the next stone. You can see the Tyropian Valley today. These are pictures I took this, well, it's not this year anymore. It's 2021. One year ago, just shy of, there at the temple. Those are the stones of the temple that were knocked down over the wall and shoved aside. This is a beautiful picture of Enrique posing in front of the temple wall. It's a nice shot, isn't it? But this is the valley, and you see all the stones there in the background. These were huge stones, not easy to push over. Jeremy and Enrique were not able to knock over a temple stone as they were trying to push on one of them. No luck. But they would have huge pry bars, and what happens is the unthinkable. Not one stone. There's specificity in what he's saying. He's specific. It's not just the temple will be destroyed. He's actually saying not one stone will stand. Now you can destroy the temple without going out of the way of knocking out even the second stone from off of the first and the first stone from off of the, the base. Their minds are blown. Yet it shouldn't be too surprising to us in the days we live. I don't do a lot of news. I find you'll get really depressed if you watch the news a lot. But word on the street is there's been a lot of crazy stuff going on in D.C. And things that people never would have thought were possible are happening before our eyes every day. Tell generations before some of the stuff we're seeing. Would that ever happen? Selfies? <laughs> Capitol Hill? No way. And this isn't about this side or that side. What it is is we are still today in the last hundred years in the generation of the oldest people in the room, seeing things from their childhood until today that would never have been thinkable. So you can see why the disciples, when they say the, 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 the temple's going to be destroyed, tell us about the end of the world. Because they're thinking this has got to be it if the temple gets destroyed. But here, he's in the temple. It's during the daytime. So let's get picking up pace here. Verse 7, he, they, the people, so this is immediately not the disciples alone, but the crowd is asking, what are the signs, Jesus? Verse 8, take heed that you be not deceived. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he. The time is drawn near. Therefore, do not go after them. But when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified. For these things must come to pass... But the end will not come immediately. He's telling them right here, the end, it's going to seem like it's coming, but it's not going to happen immediately. There's going to be other events that have to take place before the end comes. Now, something that I, I forgot to have my slide guys add in was a picture of the classic conjunction junction, what's your function, right? And it's for hooking up words and clays and problems. Okay. But anyway, but there's going to be a lot of conjunctions in this text that's really important because to us, if we read it quickly, we could blur everything together into one event. But when you watch the buts, befores, all these words help us piece together this picture. So the end, but the end's not coming immediately. What's the end? So there's a transition between verses 9 and 10. If you're a note taker, you know, these are things to get in there. Verse 10 is a description of the end or the very end of times. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be great earthquakes in various places, famines and pestilence. There'll be fearful signs, sights and great signs from heaven. But before all these things, verse 12. So he takes a detour in verse 10 and 11 to talk about in the end, this is what we're going to be seeing. And then he's going to shift back to before. So tonight we'll be talking about the end more, but this is actually talking to before all that. This is going to be more immediate to the Jewish people listening there that day. Now, speaking of the end, which I won't go into great detail because we'll be doing it at the nights, but this earthquakes in various places, famines, pestilence, 
Would you believe that as time draws by, like birth pangs, the way Jesus describes it is contractions. And I've said it before, right? Every woman who's had a baby, you remember it's like, this has got to be the one. You know, and the nurse is like, right, four centimeters dilated, got a little more to go. What? That was the one. It's not the one. It's, it's these, this increasing in intensity, and we're going to see increase in frequency, more things going on. The idea of diseases and pestilence actually increasing. Did you, do you believe that at the end of times there might be like widespread disease? Yeah. I wonder how we'll handle it. Um, you're going to see increase in earthquakes. What we're seeing, I, this is what I spent some time doing this, and although earthquakes, um, measuring how many earthquakes or size of earthquakes, but when you look at lethal earthquakes, that's a big deal. See, earthquakes happening in various places where there's no people is one thing, but seeing earthquakes that are happening in cities and, and killing people, killer quakes, those are on the rise. We see all these things taking place. But, conjunction, before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, but it'll turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. This idea of bringing them into the synagogues, this was like before 70 AD, before the temple was destroyed, because up until that point, they still had some power. By the time the Jews get expelled from Rome. They get expelled from other cities. We read about that in Acts. talks about being expelled from Rome. They get kicked out of Israel. They lose all their power. There's no going to be taking them to the synagogue to judge people because the Jews are going to be the outcasts at that point in history. So what he's talking about is coming soon. Verse 14, it says, Therefore settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But not a hair on your head shall be lost. By your patience possess your souls." talking. The disciples are there, right? The other disciples. We say the disciples. Sometimes we think of the 12, but there was the 70 that get sent out. And there was just everyone who followed Jesus. These are the people coming and listening. And he's warning them about what is to come. I like it how it's put in the book of Acts, when people were joining the church, that was under a great season of persecution under Nero and under others. Nero, Caesar Nero, used to take Christians and hang them on the walls of, of Rome and light them on fire to light the way. This is the stuff that, I mean, this was what was going on. So when people became Christians, it wasn't like, I'm going to find a nice church. I'm going to meet some new friends. I'm going to have a great, no, no. This was like, you're joining a biker gang that's known for, you know, dying because of what kind of stuff they get into. That was becoming a Christian. And Jesus is saying, don't stress about what you're going to say, what you're going to do. I'm going to take care of you. You focus on possessing your souls. You focus on your Christian walk. I'll worry about what's going to be your end because there's going to be a testimony. And there are so many stories that we could go on for days. Get Fox's Book of Martyrs. I'm going to get the books back on the website with a new website soon. I used to have a lot of free books. Fox's Book of Martyrs is one of them. Great account of just martyrs throughout the centuries. And these people who are fed to lions and they never denounce Jesus Christ. Sometimes we struggle to share them with people at work. And they would go to their deaths, never once shaking in their faith because they had his words and they clung to it. But even more, there's some cool stuff that's about to come. Verse 20. This is kind of the meat of our message, 20 and on. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart and let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. One thing to note is that these words were spoken 
before 70 AD. We have old enough gospel records and, and the, the historicity of the gospel accounts are solid enough. We know this is written before these things happened. And they were told, you're going to get scattered. We're going to scatter you across the globe. This is what God is going to do. And Gentiles, non-Jews, are going to control Israel until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. This is part of prophecy, that they would be kicked out. And in a generation, within the generation, they get kicked out. They get kicked out, and they're all over the globe. What happens during this time? A short history lesson. I don't know if there's any history nerds. I'm a nerd. I like this kind of stuff. I find it fun and interesting. So you go about 30 plus years after the crucifixion of Jesus, 66 AD, a little more than 30, and there's tension. Why did Pontius Pilate, why will he in the upcoming chapters, why was he having a, such a tough time with the Jews? Pilate had already had previous issues where he tried bringing some of the Roman eagles into the temple. It created a huge riot because they were worshipped and it was idolatry to the Jews. He had had other issues. So when this Jesus thing came before Pilate, he's like, I, I can't fight the masses. These people are screaming, crucify him. He washes his hand and says, it's not me who's doing it, but he let him. Because the people were growing more and more intolerant of Rome. 30 years beyond that date, and there was all these issues, Caesarea Maritime, fighting back and forth. Eventually, Agrippa, King Agrippa II from the book of Acts, he has to bail in 66 because the Jews are now revolting. In 66, the Jews revolt against Rome and they kill an entire Roman legion. And that's like a big deal to Rome. Rome doesn't take it, you know, lightly when an entire legion of trained Roman soldiers are killed. They run down the Valley of Agilon, same valley where uh, Joshua had the sun stand still. They retreated. Jews take over Israel. But by 67, Rome gets one of its greatest generals at the time, Vespasian, to move on in. Starting at the north, he begins sweeping down through the Galilee, taking out city by city by city. One of my favorite stops actually in Israel is Magdala. Now in the Bible, all we hear of Magdala is Mary Magdalene. She was from Magdala. But what's cool is when you go there, it was never rebuilt. Many cities in the promised land have been rebuilt and rebuilt and rebuilt. So you always see layer upon layer. Magdala never got rebuilt. So when you go see their synagogue, it is the synagogue Jesus walked on. And you see the exact floor where he set his feet. Very cool. So it's destroyed. It's one of the destroyed cities from Rome. He moves on in, takes about two years of just fortified cities. He's moving his way down to Jerusalem. He begins to besiege Jerusalem, but then problems are happening in Rome. At the end of 68, Nero commits suicide and now begins in 69 AD, what's called the year of four emperors. So we've got Galba, Caesar, takes over, and people didn't really like him whole month, much. So by January of 69, he took over in the fall, in the winter of 68, by the beginning of January, Ortho takes over. This guy's killed. Ortho takes over. No one really likes Ortho either, so he commits suicide. So then Vitellius takes over. No one really likes Vitellius either, but he was in Rome. And at this point, the people of Rome and the soldiers are saying, Vespasian's the guy. We want Vespasian to be Caesar. So Vespasian stops the besieging of Jerusalem, heads out, he leaves. Everyone else just holds, we're holding course. So 69, the Romans kind of stopped. He goes back, takes over Rome. He sends in his son, Titus Vespasian, who will become Caesar after him. Titus then re-besieges Jerusalem. It's during that point in time that historians Eusebius and Epiphanes and others record all the Christians left Rome because they had these words. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, you know that its desolation is near. Don't go back to Jerusalem. You run. The idea of if you're out in the field, don't go back to the city because in those days, the city walls were your only protection. If you're in the field and you see soldiers, you run to the city for protection. Jesus is like, uh-uh. In those days, you see soldiers, you book it another direction because the city is going to fall. We already talked about the destruction of the temple, all the battles, cool stuff, not enough time today. But what I'll say is this. Josephus, the historian, he records, he records 1.1 million Jews killed. The thing is, they came in in April. 
They came in right after Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And for those of us who are doing our Passover and our, our Israeli feast, we know that people, pilgrims, come from all over for Passover. Why there might only be a quarter of a million people in Jerusalem during the normal parts of the year, it would flourish to over a million during Passover, like Jesus right now as he's speaking. Passover, it quadruples or quintuples in size. That is when the Romans decided to besiege them, right? As everyone shows up for Passover and they trapped everyone there. As they went through, they were so angry, it was. Every man, every woman, every child, anyone was killed. Out of the million they killed, they did take 97,000 as slaves. Most of those slaves ended up going to the Colosseum and to other places. For those who don't know, the Colosseum was actually, it's, it's the Flavian dynasty is what made it. Titus and his spoils from Jerusalem is what funded the building of the Colosseum, where they took the Jews to then, you know, have them play games. And so this is history unfolding of what Jesus said. Not one stone is going to stand before above another. They're all going to fall. The Jews were massacred, and yet again, multiple historians, ancient historians, not like modern, right? The guys who were around back then, not one Christian was killed because they took what Jesus said to heart. Jesus calls the future out, and the people who listen they're protected. They're blessed. This is part of what this idea is. Last week, we talked about God's perfect timing. How many people listened to last week's message or you were here last week? We looked at the triumphant entry and it's the mind blowing how God says it and boom, it happens. Here we see it happening again. And he finished verse 24 where we finished off was it'll be there until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. You see, Romans 11 here and other places, it speaks of a season of the Gentiles where God is going to work through his church. Gentiles and Jews together, Jews who believed in Jesus, non-Jews were all together. Here's a season where he's trying to reach the Gentiles and he's waiting to get the last of the Gentiles in. So if you all would just get your friends saved, we could go home. Okay? Let's, let's bring our A game to next week. But the point is, is it says in verse 25 now, it's going to describe the end of the, what is the times of the Gentiles and the end. So here we're shifting to a look to the future again. And there will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth, distress of nations, perplexities, the seas with waves and roaring, men's hearts failing from the fear of the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heavens will be shaken. Verse 27, then they will see the Son of Man coming on a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift your heads because your redemption draws near. For those who are going to be in those times, here's what's going to be experienced. They're going to have to make it out to the end. Verse 29, Then he spoke to them the parable, Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the, God, the kingdom of God is near. Surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. He shifts them to this parable of the fig tree. Now we need to keep this in context of our chapter. Jerusalem's going to be destroyed and there's going to be this time of the Gentiles. And Jerusalem will be occupied by Gentiles, non-Jews, until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. That's what it says. And he gives the parable of the fig tree. Now, throughout the Old Testament, many things are used to symbolize Israel. They've used a vineyard. They use an olive tree. They also use a fig tree. And usually specifically, it's not just the tree, but it's the figs on the tree. Note takers, Hosea 9.10. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first fruits on the fig tree in its first season. He says, I, you guys are like figs on the fig tree. That's what I see you guys as. Jeremiah 8, 13. I will surely consume them, Israel. This is not a happy talk. Says the Lord, no grapes shall be on the vine, no figs on the fig tree, and the leaf shall fade. He's talking about the fig tree. But here's to me what is partly the most convincing. What is he talking about with this fig tree? In Matthew and Mark, something Luke doesn't record it says, and seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves and said, let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered away. Now what's the context of this? If you follow Mark, you can put the chronology together. Triumphant entry is on Sunday. 
It says in Mark that the next day, on his way to the temple to clean out the temple, he curses the fig tree. It's the next day when the disciples see the tree that he cursed that they see that it had withered. Now, as we all know, if you're going to clean a temple, you need to have energy and you can't have low blood sugar. So he's looking for some figs. Oh, that was a joke. Nothing? Okay, I got a smile on the back. I can go with that. He's going to clean the temple. He's looking at the fig tree. It says he was hungry. He goes up, no figs, and he curses it. And then he's, when the, yeah, the next day, the disciples go, so it's Tuesday. Isn't that the fig tree you just cursed? Now it's all shriveled up. And Jesus uses that as a teaching point. When he showed up on Palm Sunday, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if you had known this day, your day, that's the kind of the theme of these three days, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. He's talking about you guys missed the boat. You didn't see what was coming. And he curses this fig tree. Luke 21 is later that day. So when they just watched him curse the fig tree and make it shrivel, and he talks about, this is a relation. Yes, Israel, I came looking for fruit, and Israel didn't have fruit. Just like this fig tree is now your guys' visual example of how it didn't have the fruit, so boom, it got cursed and withered. And now he's telling him, though, but watch when it begins to bud again. Here we are in Luke 29 to 33. When you see the fig tree begin to bud again, now you know the time is near. I don't want to steal all of my stuff for tonight because tonight's focus is understanding Israel because Israel plays a big part in understanding all of this. If we don't get what God's trying to do in them, through them, in them, through them, with them, there we go, then we're not going to understand everything else. So here's the deal. They get kicked out. I'll probably repeat some of this tonight. It's good for memorization. From 250 to 1950, give or take, it's recorded that they were kicked out, fully kicked out of over 80 nations. That comes to less than every 22 years. It didn't, you know, happen on the clock. But can you imagine? Most of us here today could not say that we ever lived in one place. I don't know how many of you have seen Fiddler on the Roof. That's the idea. They come in and they start, you know, destroying weddings and this and that until finally they say, you're just not welcome anymore. Get out. Over 80 times, every 22 years, if you do the average, the Jews were kicked out of a country. You can go through countries of Europe and you can find almost every single country of Europe at one point or another kicked the Jews out. They were never allowed to own land. They were farmers, right? That's what they did. They had herds and so they were shepherds and they were farmers. No one would give them land or let them use land. So they, were, they had to find new skills. You know what the Jews did? They became lawyers, lawyers, doctors, jewelers, bankers, and then everyone hated them because they had so much money. <laughs> but this is the problem is that everywhere they went and you'll find the nations that cursed them and kicked them out, it's amazing to watch, boom, those nations kick the bucket. Interesting Spain, I'll just give one example. It's just interesting stuff for me. You guys got to humor me. Smile and nod like you're following my, my, rant, my rabbit trails and rants. Spain kicks the Jews out, Okay? Soon after they kicked the Jews out, their entire armada is destroyed by the English, um, most of which was from the English being good, good, good boats, but also the huge storm came the day before the battle and just destroyed and wreaked havoc on the Spanish fleet. You want to know the year that they kicked out the Jews? 1492. What else happened that year? Columbus sailed the ocean blue. You know, if you actually go and do some research, I, just, I didn't do, go deep, but there are many people who actually think that he has Jewish roots, Columbus, and that you find out that Queen Isabella was not the one who actually did most of the funding for his voyage, but it was Jewish bankers because they were getting kicked out and they needed to find a place to live so that he was going to take them to India. He missed. But point is, is that they've been kicked out again and again and again. And they've gone through more things like the Holocaust that most of us will never know because it's just not emphasized enough in history. Events where it wasn't just kicking them out, it was wiping them out, right? This is not just an expel, this is an exterminate. And yet they're still around again and again and again. We all know about the Holocaust because that's at least one thing school started to emphasize in recent generations. And it was the Holocaust that got them out of Europe in most places, if you get a chance to ever go to Israel and go to the Holocaust Museum, Yad Vashem, it's, it's 
powerful, beyond powerful, to see what they went through. You know where they went, most of them, though, after that? They tried to go to Israel, but they weren't allowed in. They put them in concentration camps on Cyprus. We've got downstairs, we have a little DVD library downstairs for those who want to, The Exodus with Paul Newman. Good movie, but it's historically, you'll learn about the birth of Israel. Finally, when it was realized that they needed a place to go, in 1947, they begin to come in. In 1948, May 14th, the announcement is given that Israel is a nation again. And that was promised in the Bible as well, that God would bring them back and he would reestablish them in the land. Most of us do not fathom how insane that is. There is not one culture or nation on the planet, aside from Israel, who are living in the same place, speaking the same uh, language, worshiping the same God as they were 3,000 years ago. Egypt doesn't speak ancient Egyptian, and it's not, mostly not the same people. Different people have moved in and things like that. Here's the thing. We have a friend. He was in the picture there. Boom. Many of us know who Jeremy is. He comes here. He serves in a different church. He's active in his church up in Topish. He comes here at nights and stuff. Jeremy is from the Yakima Nation, and he's very involved uh, with his tribe and stuff. And I loved this discussion we have sometimes. And he went with me, and he just going to Israel and seeing this stuff together. But we talk about how many people from the Yakima Nation can still speak a Chishkin. How many people can actually speak their language? And he'll tell you, it's a very small handful who can actually speak the language. You know, not just like some people toss out words and can order food, right? But actually speak it. He says, you know, if, if a specific effort is not done, the language will be dead within the generation. This has been less, or around, not less than, around 200 years. The Jews were gone for 2,000 years. They weren't allowed to settle anywhere. Moved again, moved again, moved again. I'm not going to say necessarily the, the Native Americans were treated greatly, but they were given places and allowed to try to keep their, their culture together. The Jews weren't, and yet they did. And in 1948, they became a nation again. Now, uh, for what it's worth, too, if you add 72.2 years, the average age of a human on the earth, it comes to 2020 or 2021. Just throwing that out there, a generation. Um, but here's the thing. The time of the Gentiles. Jerusalem and the epicenter of Jerusalem is the temple. That's all they care about, really. They didn't get the temple in 1948. They only got half of Jerusalem. Got another video downstairs. It's kind of a documentary video on this. Really good um, if you want to learn about it. I forget the name, but you'll find it if it's down. You want to go check it out. Um, so in 1967, there was a six-day war. All of their neighbors, I didn't mention, but May 14th, 1948, they became a nation. May 15th, 1948, every single surrounding Arab nation attacks them. Now, when you become a nation, you're baby day one. You don't have an army, right? It was miraculous that they survived. In 67, they fight. They are trying to stop an incoming invasion. Lebanon, Syria, Egypt. Egypt's got tanks on the borders. They have huge fleets of, of uh, aircraft they're getting ready to bring in. Israel does a preemptive strike because they know if they don't strike, they're going to be attacked and they will be eliminated. The Arabs in 48, what do they say? We're going to push the Jews into the sea. Not we're going to fight a battle. We are going to push the Jews into the sea. Six-day war, future wars, Iran in the last decade. How many times? This is their goal. Annihilate Israel. Not give us back some land. Not settle over Gaza Strip. They just want Israel dead. But they get back Jerusalem, and they take the Temple Mount. I'm going to have to cut that story short, but it's beautiful. Uh, it's just fun to watch. There's a rabbi. They didn't want him to come. He's carrying a Torah on his back. They have video of this stuff. And because he's going to be there. When they get to the temple, he is going to be there with that Torah. They hang the flag. It's a beautiful scene of these people coming home, worshiping at the wall. But you know what they do? They give the temple mount, the mount itself, back to the, to the, the Muslims because the Dome of the Rock was there. And since then, so much controversy and fighting has been happening over that, over that site. 
In 73, they get attacked in the Yom Kippur War. Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, holiest day in all of Israel. Everyone, sh- it's a Sabbath day. Everything's turned off. Everyone is fasting. The enemies attack on that day because they know that's the day you'll catch them off guard. So many miracles and amazing stories about how they survived through that war. In the 80s, they're at war with Lebanon. In the early 90s and early 2000s, we have the first Antifada and the second Antifada where streams of people are coming with bombs strapped to themselves, walking into cafes and blowing them up. They had to build walls all the way around Jerusalem to protect themselves because they just could not stop the non-ending flow of people just blowing themselves up all around the city. December 6th, 2017, something changes that had never been done before. One of the world powers actually recognizes Jerusalem to belong to Israel And that was Donald Trump, our president, love him or hate him. This is a good thing. When he says Israel has Jerusalem and Jerusalem is their capital and we're moving our embassy down there to Jerusalem. We're moving our embassy to their capital. Here's me at the embassy this year. That was just kind of fun to actually see the embassy was on the way back to the hotel. And it was a big deal because again, even though they have Jerusalem, the world doesn't recognize that they have Jerusalem. And they don't have the Temple Mount in their control Yet, it's still controlled by the Muslims and the Alaska Mosque and the Mosque and the, all the things that are up there. But they're ready for the day when they'll be able to build a temple, which the Bible talks about, a third temple. Hurva is the main synagogue in the old city. Down there to the right is a golden menorah. That is not just a, but the golden menorah that they've already built to go in the new temple. All the elements of the temple, everything, they have it built already. They're ready to build a temple. They have things waiting. They just need a green light. And if you've ever been on an Israel trip with me before, you'll know that I am very much sold on what's called the northern location of the temple. I believe that the temple was not on the Dome of the Rock. I believe it was to the north of the Dome of the Rock. And one day, I think, with great assurance, that a diplomat of some sort is going to make that noted And he's going to open the door for them to build that temple just to the north of the Dome of the Rock. And if you ask Jews today in Jerusalem, how will you know who your Messiah is? He is the one who's going to get us that third temple. And he'll make a covenant with many, dot, dot, dot. Some know where that goes. We'll talk about those at the night. The main thing is this. The fig tree. When you see it starting to bud and starting to bloom, Know that the end is near. Can I just, I'll just read this again. Verse 29. So he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. And as surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. So this is what he does. He tells everyone, this is how it's going to go out. Once again, statistically, if you're just into math and numbers, you can do the math and you can read things about what was the chances of Israel getting Israel to be made a nation? What was the chances for some of these other things happen? Statistically speaking, it's impossible. You know, there are greater chances to be struck by lightning 18 times between here and Safeway than for this stuff to happen, but it did. And so Jesus closes with exhortation. Verse 34, he says, but take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. That word, carousing and drunkenness, I don't think we need a big description of. That's just, you know, people are into partying. They're into satisfying their flesh. But here's that cares of this life. How many people, note takers and good, good memory people, marimna, that's the stuff that Jesus has to call out. Martha, You've got a lot of marim now, these cares. You're worried about a Martha. This is the stuff when the parable of the sower, the seed in the thorny soil, it's the cares of this life. It, it's, it's just worrying about getting everything done and the, the, the kids get done and is the laundry done and is the world, is all this stuff. It's getting worried about everything in your day-to-day life. And Jesus is saying, don't let partying get you distracted. He goes, but don't let life, just everyday life, Get you distracted to where you don't see the obvious as it's coming right before your eyes. 
for it'll come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Verse 36, watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. I really think that verse 36 is self-explanatory, but we're going to break it down because it's super important. He tells them, watch, be ready, be serving, be active, have a life that has no shame. I have no reason to be ashamed. I'm living this life the way I want because you will be worthy to escape. Now in the Greek, escape means escape, not be there. You escaped. The next word is all. Pas in the Greek, which always means all. <laughs> that you can escape all these things. Where am I going to be? In a bunker? Am I going to be in Petra? Where am I going to be? That will come to pass and to stand, histemi, I'll get to, before the Son of Man. Histemi is a word, it doesn't just mean like I am located, it means to be placed and standing. Like this is standing here because I put it there. Does that make sense? You place something and now it's histemi in the Greek. I place it there, it's setting there. You're going to be escaping all this craziness and it says you will stand before the Son of Man. I'm not going to have you here, you're escaping there so that you can be standing here. That'll be important for one of our future night services. Other promises that we need to take to mind. These are good ones to write down. Cross references worthy of having in your Bible. Revelation 3.10, because you have kept my command to persevere, the church of Philadelphia, I'll keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Once again, it's a promise I'm going to keep you from the hour of trial, which is coming on the whole world. Whole world means whole world. I'm going to keep you from it, not through it. And there's no way to translate that to the Greek differently. I've, I've, I've read people, I've tried, and it's like, no, it's, it's keeping you from it. You will not be experiencing that hour of trial. The next day, this was Tuesday, Luke 21. On Wednesday, they finished the Last Supper and it's like what I call the Holy of Holies of the New Testament, John 14, 15, 16, 17. Beautiful talk as he walks from the upper room down to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he kicks off that talk with these verses. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe in me also, right? In my Father's house, there are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. And I go, I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. He's going up to be with the Father. He says, I'm preparing a place, and I'm going to come. I'm going to receive you to be with me, which is different because the Bible does speak explicitly of another event, it seems, where Jesus says, I'm going to come back to the earth, dwell on the earth, reign on the earth. There are two things. 1 Corinthians 15 51 and 52, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trump will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. At some point, there's an event and we're not all going to die, but something's going to happen. It's going to be miraculous and supernatural. We're all going to be changed. If you read more, our bodies will be made like his glorious body, the one that he had after he resurrected, and it's going to happen at the last trump. Now, here's the thing, just for what it's worth before we move on. Last trump. It can mean the last trump in a series. It can also be a title, the last trump, as in the trump that's like the, the one that signals the last. So you can actually interpret it two different ways in the sense of this will be the last in a series or it's this is the trump that signals the last, the ending trump. Like, boop, 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 boop. You know, you go to battle, charge, you know, bah, 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 bedtime, ba 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 ba. it's the end. It's the last trump that signals what's happening. Keep a finger in Luke, but let's flip to 1 Thessalonians 4 so we can wrap this up. I 
I'm going to say, I'm shamelessly just trying to get people to come tonight. You see, I'm just, just trying to get everyone interested and excited. But it's a chapter we are in, and so I'm teaching the chapter. In 1 Thessalonians 4, I'm keeping my finger in Luke 21, starting in verse 13, he says, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. This only shows up a few places, this phrase, and I always tell people to take note the few times Paul says, don't be ignorant. And I jokingly said the other day, when you look at the things he says that about, it's the things that many Christians are the most ignorant about. Certain ideas and theologies and things. He says, don't be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep. That's a nice way of saying have died. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. I like to use this verse at funerals to remind Christians that as Christians who lose or at least temporarily depart from our beloved Christian friends and family, we have no reason to sorrow as those who have no hope. We have a blessed hope, and we have a hope of seeing them again in a reunion in heaven. But it says, For if we believe that Jesus dies and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Verse 15, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. There is this fear that like if they miss the boat, if they die, they somehow miss the boat. And so Paul's saying, no, 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 don't worry. If they die, they're going to be with the Lord. They're not missing nothing. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet with the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Popular verses that I'm not even going to go very deep in. But I will say this. Notice it says we're going to meet the Lord in the air and we're going to be with him. I'm going to go prepare a place for you that where I am you may be also. I'm going to receive you unto me. It's a receiving up to him. But verse 18, therefore comfort one another with these words. If all the stuff that we read about in verses 25 to 28 of Luke, I'm going to stay in 1 Thessalonians for a sec, but the the, the wars, the craziness, you read the book of Revelation, the idea that there could be a promise that I don't have to endure that hour of trial that's going to come upon the whole earth, that would be comforting words. If there's a promise that I don't need to worry, that I will be able to escape all these things, that I will be able to stand before the Son of Man, that's a comforting promise. So it makes sense that it's a comforting promise. And just a few verses into the next chapter, because so often people don't, you know, they read that, that's the rapture, and then they just like stop reading. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the, the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. And I will stand by it that we'll never know the day or the hour. I could never give you a day, but we know the seasons. We know we should be ready because it sure seems like, man, Lord, if all these things you said would come true, start coming true, I should be ready. Verse 3, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Here's the thing. They say peace and safety, and then suddenly destruction comes upon them. Sudden destruction. That word, suddenly, out of nowhere, unexpected. Ironically, it only shows up two places in the New Testament, in the Bible, that word in the Greek. The other place, Luke 21, and it was in verse 34, that we should not be caught up in carousing, drunkenness, cares of this life, that the day come on you unexpectedly. And so there's this warning, and then you can tie these two texts together, understanding that It's going to be unexpected by the world, but it should not be unexpected by the church, and that we should live our lives in such a way that we are prepared so that if Jesus cut things short today, I can enter into the Lord and be a worker who needs not be ashamed. I can enter into the Lord and I can hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And so the idea that Jesus could come as lightning flashes from the east into the west, that he'll come as a thief in the night, that he'll come when no one else is expecting it in the whole world. It'll be a snare to the world. But I should know, okay, Lord, you could come during church. You could come Monday night. And you could come Tuesday morning. And it just keeps me continually wanting to live in such a way 
that I live a life of no regrets, that I live a life like, all right, I'm using my time and I'm using it for the Lord. And I will say it, because I said it a couple weeks ago as we looked at a similar text. It never should promote foolishness because God doesn't want to show up to me racking up my credit cards because I think he's coming next week. And he, doesn't, you know, he wants me to come. And if he comes watching me playing with my kids, he'll come at a great time as I'm walking in obedience, raising them up. If he comes with me setting up my 401k, that's good because he knows that if he didn't come, I was preparing for anything. But regardless, I am prepared whether he comes today or in 30 years, I'm living my life on a course where I'm not going to be needing to have that shame, that regret. If God has been so faithful to have his word come out exactly as he says up until this point, how much more can we trust that in the future he's going to continue to do the same? And so, next Sunday, we go into the Last Supper and his arrest. We're going to see the crucifixion of Jesus. But this Sunday, hey, let's just pray and let's just get right. And, you know, the, the offer is always there. If you don't have full confidence... Because the Church of Philadelphia in Romans three, or Romans, Revelation 3.10 was said, because you persevered, you kept doing what I told you to do. Here, watch, therefore, and pray always that you be counted worthy. The idea is, is make sure you, that you've got your faith settled. Jesus earlier, he says, you worry about your soul, but by your patience, possess your souls. If you don't have a confidence in that, well, as always, today's the day. So let's seek the Lord. Let's seek his face. Let's worship him and just ask that God would bless us with his presence even here today just by his Holy Spirit moving and working in our midst. Let's pray.